I'm very happy to welcome William B. Grant, one of the foremost specialists on vitamin D in the world. There are so many papers you have written, uh, Dr. Grant, so it's almost impossible to mention them all without having a couple of hours only for that. But would you mind to make a short introduction of yourself and your work before we dive into the specific questions for tonight's subject? Yes, yes. First of all, Goran, uh, thanks for inviting me to do this interview. Uh, as for my background, I have a PhD in physics, uh, followed by a 30-year career in using lasers for remote sensing of the atmosphere. I participated in many uh, field missions with NASA to study ozone and aerosols. And then starting in 1996, I turned my attention to health studies. I wrote the first paper on the uh, role of dietary factors in uh, risk of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. I then studied uh, diet and cancer. And in 1999, when uh, the new maps for uh, cancer mortality rates in the United States were published, I started investigating the role of ultraviolet radiation and vitamin D in reducing the risk of cancer. Uh, and I identified 10 types of cancer for which ultraviolet radiation was protecting. So I, I retired from NASA in 2004 and have spent um, my full time since then uh, studying uh, health issues, primarily uh, the role of ultraviolet radiation and vitamin D in uh, uh, reducing the risk of many types of chronic and infectious diseases. And uh, like you say, I've published many papers. I have 170 uh, publications. That's um, uh, full, full length articles as well as letters to the editor. Uh, on vitamin D listed at PubMed. So I'm, I'm just, uh, I consider this the golden age of vitamin D uh, research, and I'm, I'm very happy to be uh, a part of that uh, uh, research effort. Yeah, thank you, and you really do a good job also to explain for us non-scientists uh, the practical um, implementations of, uh, of using UV light in, in the correct way to, to make vitamin D in the way that nature intended it. But um, what we um, should touch upon tonight is, um, I call it a little bit your frustration of uh, how slow uh, health authorities are to uh, adopt the new findings from you and your colleagues about vitamin D. So in a recent blog post, you actually give us a unique insight into the work of um, a subgroup to WHO, to the World Health Organization. Uh, which has the task to give recommendations to health authorities all around the world on how to handle the delicate balance between too much and too little UV exposure. Uh, can you, with a few words in uh, such as non-scientific language as you can, tell us a little bit about that work? How long has it been going on and uh, what's the result so far? Okay, if we can go back to the beginning of the concern about skin cancer and ultraviolet radiation from the sun. Uh, I, I think it, uh, the public became aware of the role of UV in, in, in the risk factor for skin cancer probably around the mid-1970s um, when it was first uh, uh, announced that uh, fluorofluorocarbons or CFCs were destroying the stratospheric ozone layer, which is our shield against solar ultraviolet B radiation, or UVB. Uh, it turns out that claiming that loss of the ozone layer would greatly increase the risk of skin cancer was a simple message that can engage the public in the campaign to stop producing CFCs. And about that time, uh, or shortly thereafter, sunscreen sales began increasing rapidly. And for example, in Australia in the early 80s, they had the uh, uh, introduced the program Slip Slap Slop to encourage everybody to, to um, put on sunscreen and try to avoid the sun. And interestingly, as apparently as a result, squamous cell carcinoma rates uh, uh, decrease, but mel melanoma rates increase. Uh, the reason for the divergent trends is that sunscreen blocks the UVB, which is uh, both an important factor for squamous cell carcinoma, uh, but also uh, the source of, of, of vitamin D. Yet sunscreen has very little effect on UVA, which is the important risk factor for melanoma. Uh, using sunscreen lets people stay in the sun longer without burning, so they get more UVA photons. So the more melanoma rates increased, the stronger the message from the dermatologist to stay out of the sun and wear sunscreen. So that was the early history. Now, in 2005, 
the International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection uh, held an international workshop on UV exposure guidance, uh, a balanced approach between health risks and health benefits of UV and vitamin D. They invited many of the leading vitamin D researchers to attend, along with those interested in protecting people against skin cancer and melanoma. Uh, I, I participated in that meeting and, and found it very, very worthwhile. Uh, many good papers were published as a result of that workshop. Now, move ahead to 2011, and this same organization convened another workshop, but did not invite the vitamin D researchers. Despite the fact that evidence uh, that UVB and vitamin D are required for optimal health has increased, in the minds of the 2011 workshop participants, the strength of the evidence has decreased based on a couple of reviews, uh, one by the International Agency for Research in Cancer and one by the Institute of Medicine in the United States. Uh, never mind um, that the reviews they mentioned were made by either those trying to protect people from skin cancer or protecting the interests of big pharma. Okay, big pharma or uh, big cosmetic, maybe that's the same thing. So what you mean that after six years of... <clears throat> Six years of work, and in spite of a mountain of evidence of the benefits of vitamin D from sunlight, uh, this working group has not been able to move from the position that sunlight is only bad for us and uh, nothing good at all comes from it. Yes. Hmm. So what could be the reasons for this, in your opinion? You mentioned in your blog post that the majority of uh, the participants in the working group are the same people that actively have been collecting evidence during more than 20 years about how dangerous sunlight is and even participate in the work to get sunlight and tanning beds classified as carcinogens in the most dangerous group. Uh, in what way can this influence on their reluctance now to too slowly admit that some sunlight might be good and even necessary for us? Well, they, they've invested lots of time and energy in the researching the adverse effects of UV. And so they have a mindset that readily accepts the evidence of harm from UVA, UVB, but generally discounts the evidence of health benefits. Uh, this is easy for them to do since nearly all the studies of the health benefits have some flaws. However, taken as a whole, the evidence is very strong. That's uh, that's true, of course, and, and you know all about that side. But um, what was interesting of course, is that um, you write that in their answer to you, they are claiming that the way uh, your and your colleagues on the vitamin D side, let's call it like this, the way you have uh, conducted your research, in principle by uh, um, uh, case control studies, is not acceptable. But at the same time, as I understand, that is the way that all research of the connections between the sunlight and uh, tanning beds and, and melanoma and other skin cancers, they are also based on the same kind of, of uh, research. Is that true? Okay. I, I emphasize the ecological approach, which is where uh, it, look at geographical distribution of, say, cancer and, and geographic distribution of solar ultraviolet D doses and do statistical correlations. And uh, that approach is, is not viewed very favorably by the, the health establishment. Uh, what you see for the population as a whole doesn't apply to individuals or their confounding factors that might play a role. But in, in my, re, re, my comment on their finding, I said that that's the strongest evidence, uh, but nonetheless, it's... it's, it's there's other evidence from the case control studies, the cohort studies, the randomized controlled trial studies, uh, and, and, and so on, and that altogether it, it, it finds a strong uh, um, uh, effect. Now, w yeah, what they 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 over um, indeed uh, well, the strongest evidence for the health field is randomized controlled trials. But of course, randomized controlled trials using ultraviolet radiation would be unethical. So they have to go with, with observational studies, uh, case control, or, or cohort studies. So, indeed, um, uh, they, they're, essentially, they're, they're saying uh, applying two standards. They, they want to have the one standard for, for the benefits, another standard for the, um, the, the adverse effects. Yeah, that sounds a little bit strange to, to a layman like, like me, of course. Uh, so would you say that the vested interest by the people in the working group into scaring us away from sunlight 
and some of them uh, actually, like you're right, being uh, paid by a large manufacturer of sunscreen cosmetics. Uh, do you think that that might prevent and delay um, the health authorities to be able to save? I think you have mentioned in some other papers that as a minimum 400,000 people could be saved from dying in cancer every year if even the, the minimum uh, of, of uh, vitamin D levels would be raised. Yeah, I think my 400,000 people a year is probably all cause uh, mortality rate in the United States per year from vitamin D. And that includes cardiovascular disease, infection disease, and so ah, on. Ah, okay, not only cancers, but everything, but, but only only in the States. Yeah, but then you go to Europe, you've got a, many more. Um, in fact, what I show is that if, if um, the vitamin D concentrations would double in the populations worldwide, uh, mortality rate would decrease by about 15%. And the uh, life expectancy would increase by, by about two years. Mm -hmm. But uh, certainly in terms of vested interest, um, whether or not these, these, these people who are trying to protect the world from, from skin cancer uh, get paid by, by commercial or, or, or interest, they certainly have a lot of uh, you know, personal investment in, in, their, in their research career. They, they've made a stand that they, their goal is to, to uh, reduce the risk of skin cancer. Unfortunately, most of them are only concerned about the skin and are not concerned about the internal workings of the body, the internal cancers, the cardiovascular disease, and so on. Uh, and and um, in fact, one of the things I, I take delight in showing is that um, uh, people who get, say, basal cell carcinoma in, in Denmark have a 9% lower mortality rate than people who don't get basal cell carcinoma. Uh, I showed in Spain that the provinces that have more non-melanoma skin cancer mortality rates have reduced risk of uh, internal cancer mortality rates for 15 types of cancer. So this is just sort of um, goes like water off a duck's back uh, to the dermatologist. Uh, they don't know how to deal with, with um, something outside their field. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's, that, that, that's really uh, amazing to, um, to many people to, to see how narrow uh, view uh, health authorities are applying on this. It seems to be some people working with the skin cancers and other people working with other types of cancers and they are not coordinated in between themselves when, uh, with regards to vitamin D. Um, but um, I mean, we, we have a parallel that happened a couple of years ago, the H1N1, the swine flu vaccine. There was a big clash, uh, a big scandal, you can call it, between the European Commission and uh, the World Health Organization. And what we can say is that member of the European Parliament at that time was extremely critical uh, towards how uh, WHO handled uh, the vaccine distribution, let's say that is, or let's call it sales. Do you think that it's needed the um, involvement of politicians also in this case to, to make a change to the stand of, uh, of WHO regarding um, UV exposure and vitamin D? Uh, possibly. Uh, let me just mention that um, I, I went to Warsaw, Poland in October to attend a vitamin D uh, conference that attracted 550 people. And the upshot of the conference is that they're preparing recommendations for Central European countries uh, of 30 to 50 nanograms per milliliter, um, which uh, is uh, you know quite a bit higher than than the than what the concentrations are for most people in the Central European countries. Uh, this has been sponsored by a university. Uh, I think it'll take a little while to get to the, uh, to the, uh, the government level, but uh, that could be part of the um, nucleus, part of the, the uh, effort to get, um, get things changed around a bit. Yeah, actually, Poland was the only country in Europe that, uh, thanks to a very... Uh, knowledgeable uh, health minister of health uh, that was the only country in Europe that refused to buy the vaccine towards the swine flu aha <laughs> which is quite interesting there is a nice uh, video on youtube about that okay uh, enough about the swine flu <laughs> but anyhow i it, it seems that it's definitely needed a wider view upon upon the the dilemma between uh, sunlight and, and vitamin d right so just a final question then before we uh, wind up. I'm sitting in a very dark uh, place of the world right now. The sun uh, or the sun that could give me UVB disappeared already some three months ago. 
and the same with a lot of people living north of, uh, say, 40, 45 degrees of, of latitude. Uh, of course, tanning beds, it's almost like a swear word today. In uh, Belgium, there are advertisements on buses claiming that uh, uh, tanning beds are cancer machines and so on and so on. Uh, what is your take on uh, the possibility to fill up our vitamin D levels from tanning beds uh, during the, the time when the UVB from the natural sun is not available? Okay. Uh, the, the lamps in tanning beds uh, generally uh, have the same uh, ultraviolet spectrum as the midday, mid-latitude uh, sun hitting your surface. So, so the, the same as in Florida or, or the Mediterranean. And uh, that includes 3 to 5% uh, UVB, which produces vitamin D. There have been a number of papers showing that, um, uh, that, that tanning beds do produce uh, a lot of vitamin D, that a, a typical session will produce 10 to 20,000 international units. Uh, we consider that the daily requirement is maybe 2,000 to 4,000 uh, international units. So uh, w one session, um, perhaps one session, maybe two sessions a week, uh, could produce all the vitamin D that a person needs. Uh, it turns out, though, that, that the amount of time required for vitamin D production is probably in the order of a minute or two, which is much less than the time uh, required for tanning. Now, there have been a number of health benefits found from uh, indoor tanning. Uh, they include certainly higher uh, vitamin D concentrations, uh, increased bone strength, uh, reduced risk of endometrial cancer and uh, thrombosis, and I think uh, diabetes recently. Uh, as far as the risk go, it's um, you know there may be a little bit increased risk in from melanoma or skin cancer, but uh, you know it's, 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 I think it'd be very similar to what would happen from being in the sun. And we know that the health benefits of being in the sun are much, much stronger than the, the adverse effects. Um, the important thing is that, that people with a very, very fair, fair skin, uh, what's called type 1 skin, should avoid uh, indoor tanning because they just can't tan. And if they're going to go in, they've got to go in for a very short amount of time to produce the vitamin D. The other thing is one should never stay in a, a, a tanning bed uh, long enough to start turning uh, pink and, and burn. Uh, the, the primary risk factors for, for uh, basal cell carcinoma and melanoma are, are, is the, the burning from uh, too much UV. So uh, certainly in a place uh, such as um, northern Europe um, uh, where you don't, cannot produce vitamin D from the sun for four, five, six months of the year, uh, indoor tanning makes sense. Yeah, and northern, uh, northern North America too, I suppose. That, that's, I think it's a good advice. Short sessions, maybe a couple of times a week, should be minimum risk and maximum benefit, and, and uh, as much UVB as possible in the, in the beds. Uh, Dr. Grant, I, my readers, listeners in this case, uh, thank you very much for taking your time this evening to, um, to answer these questions, and uh, we can only say that I think the all healthy tanners, those who really want to tan for vitamin D and maybe not mainly to get as brown as possible, uh, really support your work and uh, think that what you and your colleagues are doing is, is uh, tremendously important so that more can get the benefits of, of vitamin D, uh, not only through pills but also through, the, through UV exposure. So thank you very much, uh, good luck in your future work and uh, we will look forward to hear what your uh, next paper will 